Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and, uh, well, until relatively recently, I used to each week do a video looking at some viewers' comments. And that's what this video is going to be. In particular, um, matters arising from Ian Duncan Smith's statement and my video yesterday on the fact that this guy who fully supported the Brexit withdrawal agreement now says that it's trash. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So what I've got for you is a selection of uh, viewer comments on the issue, uh, a mixture of pro and, and anti-Brexit on this one. I'm just going to throw my own thoughts in very, very quickly. It really started because you were getting some of the old common Brexit tropes coming up and I just thought it'd be a nice time to start tackling these again. Um, so the first one is a pro-Brexit one. By the way, I've not edited any of these at all. Sometimes you might want to tidy up the language and then you think, well, maybe I will unintentionally change the meaning of it. So it is as it is. We're not picking on typos. So it says, leaving the EU is freedom. All the libtards who deny that should really look at the election. Do the libtards think that 65% of the population are stupid? Go on. Fortunately, Marxists will stay out of power for a long time. Now, let's tackle one thing at a time. First of all, leaving the EU is freedom. You've heard this a lot. I'll tell you what I haven't heard a lot, or indeed at all, is, and I've asked this person as well, um, maybe they'll get back to me by the time this video goes out, what freedom will I be getting on the 1st of January 2021? What freedom, what will I be able to do next year after having left the EU and the transition period, which apparently means full sovereignty, what do I get to do that I couldn't do as an EU member? Because I can name several things that I won't be able to do that I could as an EU member. There's definitely freedoms I will have lost, including, of course, the right to travel and work in a much larger area than just my own country. So what freedom in return for that have I gained? No answer to that one. In years, not a single answer. Then there was the strange comment. I'm not going to spend too long on this because I don't really know what it's about. It says, do the libtards think that 65% of the population is stupid? Now, I'm not entirely sure where this 65% of the population come from. Um, it, it relates to the election. Are they suggesting that 65% of the population voted for Brexit candidates? Because that's not true. It was much less than 50% of the population. It was even much less than 50% of voters because obviously the number of people who vote in an election is much less than the actual population of a country. Even the number of people who are eligible to vote in an election is much less. So the 65%, I'm not sure where it's come from, uh, so I don't need to go on too much about that one. But the central thing on this one is, is about the EU being freedom. Please, I, I am going to make a real effort to try and read as many of the comments on this video as I can. Apologies, by the way, when I can't always read all comments, but I, I get quite a lot of them now. Um, seriously, what freedom am I going to get? What can I do? I, I honestly want to know. In fact, what can I do now? Because we've already left the EU. You know, is there any freedom I've missed that I can do now that I couldn't before? But if not, if it's the transition period that's the problem, what will I be able to do on the 1st of January 2021? That would be much appreciated. Uh, next one, someone pointing out here, it says, every time a Remainer warned these numpties of the dangers, we were accused of Project Fear and called Remainers. I didn't mind that too much. Who's moaning now? And this is, I mean, this is something I remarked on quite some time ago, uh, particularly uh, in February, because it is true that, that you know, there was, um, there's been a lot of complaints. Now, if you were someone who genuinely believes in Brexit, let's just say, and... Uh, and you saw the fact that we were trying to steer us towards a closer relationship with the EU, preferably out of it. I didn't want Brexit to go ahead at all. And I would have stopped it, absolutely. Um, so you can understand a certain amount of complaining there when things weren't going very well. For example, when we had a million people on more than one occasion marching in our capital against Brexit. And then Nigel Farage tried to do a counter protest and he got about 76 people on a pub crawl. I can understand them moaning about that because it was all going wrong. Uh, they didn't have that popular appeal. But then, first past the post kicked in, um, you know, anti-Corbyn sentiment kicked in, everything kicked in to allow this Brexit government to get a large majority. You'd have thought they'd have been ecstatic. 
Ecstatic. We left the EU on January the 31st, 2020. You'd have thought they'd been ecstatic. We're now heading for these the, the hallowed World Trade Organization terms, no deal Brexit. You'd think they'd be ecstatic. But no, the level of moaning has actually increased. The level of complaining has increased. Here's the thing. If someone genuinely thought that Brexit was a marvellous idea, here's what a genuine patriot would do to, to their fellow countrymen like me who are not convinced. They'd go, Phil, don't sweat it. Uh, I know you're, you're upset. Um, we'll just give it five months. In five months' time, you'll see how wonderful it is. They'd be totally calm about it, completely calm about it. In the same way that I would be if I knew someone was worrying about nothing. Just wait till it happens and you'll see it's actually not a big deal. But no, that's not their attitude. And it's not their attitude because they know that it's going to be serious. Many of these people genuinely did believe in Brexit. They didn't really think about it. They bought into all the lies. They've now seen a lot of the realities, but they can't lose the argument because that's all it is now. And, and that's why they become more and more infuriated. Because they know it's not going to... If they, thought, if they genuinely thought it was all going to be all right, they would just chill. They'd just go, look, you know, it's just paranoia. Five months' time, you'll see. Don't worry about it. But no, um, they, they feel the need to convince us because then all of us are wrong next January. They don't want the I told you so. They don't want it. Sorry, it's coming. Um, next one. <laughs> Ian Duncan Smith, this is IDS. Just go, just go quietly into the night. What a waste you are. You vote for something you don't understand. You vote for the oven ready deal. And now you complain. Words fail me. I understand you're a captain in the British Army. I think I would have followed you, not for the leadership skills, but only to try and work out where the hell you were going. Useless doesn't really do the justice. And this is an interesting point, actually. IDS, because um, people were asking me yesterday just how thick is he, like compared to Chris Grayling and people like that. He is spectacularly thick. His army career, I'm reliably... He was in the Guards, and I'm reliably informed this is where you put people from a fairly posh background when they're not very bright. Um, and he, he was promoted to captain, but given the fact that he was a career officer, the length of time he was in the British Army, really, captain was the very, very least he would have achieved. You know, anyone decent with the length of service he had in the British Army, would have reached the rank of major at least. The fact that he did not do so again told you how limited his capacity was. That was just a quick one I threw in there. I'm not going to waste too much time on that. Not really political. Um, okay, it's on here. More obsessive sociopathy, Phil. Um, this, is, this was on my comment that uh, he's voted for this treaty and by calling for it to be scrapped, he's, he's calling for the UK to stand proud and alone in the world, telling the whole world that any agreements that we sign with you, if we suddenly decide we don't like them, we're just going to tear them up. That's not really conducive to getting further deals signed with anyone, let alone the EU. Then this person saying here, treaties can be amended and they are still seeking more from us. Well, first bit first, treaties can be amended. Yes, they can. By mutual agreement. So if you sign a contract with someone, you can't just then unilaterally change it. You can agree changes, you know, let's say a tenancy agreement. If one party or the other wants to change something in it, you contact the other side. And if they agree, then you can change it. You can't have one person sign a contract because a contract is a mutual uh, expression of, 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 you know, uh, I'll do this in return for you doing this. So, you know, you don't get to change it like that. So they can't be amended just on one side. If you even attempt to, you are basically tearing it up. So no, that's not how it works. And it says, and they are still seeking more from us. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're not stupid. That's the point. The EU are not stupid. They will squeeze us for as much as they can get. The United States will squeeze us for as much as they can get. China will squeeze us. India will squeeze us. Japan will squeeze us. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, everyone will seek to squeeze us for as much as they can get. And the country's stroke trading blocks with the best negotiators will squeeze the most out of us. Who has the best negotiators in the world? Oh, that would be the EU. Who has the second best? Oh, that would be the United States. We're going to get squeezed. 
a lot. And this is the thing I like about this comment. Even when we agree on the fact of the matter, how do you suddenly turn that into benefit of Brexit? The fact that the EU are going to get more out of us now that we've left. When we had all that power, we were one of the big three in the EU. We had vetoes over everything important that would fundamentally affect us. And even on the stuff where it wasn't like a one member could vote against the whole thing, we were major, majorly influential, one of the big three. And now we're being squeezed. Hmm. Next one. Oh, biggie. Says, uh, so this is someone trying to defend Boris Johnson's deal as opposed to Theresa May's. And again, I have to point out Boris Johnson's deal was the one that Theresa May put in the bin. It was not it was not new. In fact, the only new part of the deal was Boris Johnson surrendering our stake in the European European Central Bank. I don't think that had emerged before. So there's firstly, Boris's deal has one huge, very important difference to May's deal. It had a number of actually, but OK, uh, it allows a finite end to any transition period and the possibility of World Trade Organization if nothing's agreed. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely. That was the whole point of it. That's how it got through. The Conservative Party, the ERG, that's why they voted it through. Indeed, no arguments about that. It's allowed for a, a, a definite end to the transition period. Good. May's deal would have allowed the EU to keep the UK permanently in the backstop, permanently complying with all EU rules and laws, permanently paying into the EU budget and unable to agree any free trade deals with the rest of the world. Yes, yep, yeah, absolutely. And as you say, once the UK is fully left, we are a competitor. The backstop prevented us ever becoming a competitor unless the EU allowed it. And why would they? Actually, you are wrong on that point. Now, what you're imagining here is what some Brexiteers tried to say, is that because the backstop would only end when we met certain conditions, that the EU would just randomly say, no, you haven't met the conditions, so you can't come out of the backstop. That's not actually true. It was up for international arbitration. Uh, it wasn't just down to the EU to decide that. If we met the conditions and all we had to do to meet those conditions was to allow for frictionless movement of goods and people between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland or for Northern Ireland to reunite with the Republic of Ireland so it didn't become part of the UK. Either of those conditions uh, would have allowed us to leave the backstop. The EU wouldn't have been able to just say, no, you haven't met the conditions arbitrarily. It would have been subject to an international court. Uh, so you are wrong on that point, I will say. It says the reason that the withdrawal agreement was rushed through and IDS voted for it was because the previous parliament had done everything it could to delay Brexit with the aim of ultimately stopping it and the country expected some urgent action. Um, it makes no difference whether you argue that point or not. In fact, it's not true. The reason they rushed it through is because they didn't want the country to see what was in it. Because it would take time to be properly scrutinised and for that information to filter through to members of the public. However, even if you believe that is true, the fact of the matter is that this government still rushed through and agreed that withdrawal agreement. Boris Johnson agreed with it and claimed the withdrawal agreement as his own. Ian Duncan Smith campaigned for it in the general election and indeed before the general election, saying we had an oven ready deal ready to go and we had a great deal for Britain. There's no change in that. That is the fact of the matter. So again, apart from that one thing you got wrong in this statement, largely agree with that. That is all perfectly true. But here's the thing. So you're saying it as if it would be disadvantageous for us to have remained in the EU. I don't see it that way. Uh, next one. Oh, which one are we on? Yes, here we go. So Theresa May rejected board in the Irish Sea idea. Uh, she said no prime minister would ever do it. But Bodge Job did it. I mean, I, I will go further than that. Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson himself, on one of his very, very few trips to Ireland, said the same thing. He said no British Prime Minister would ever do this. And then the very next British Prime Minister, who also coincidentally was called Boris Johnson, did exactly that almost immediately. Um, so he booted her backstop out into the, the blah, 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 and he replaced it with a customs border in the Irish Sea, ports of blah, blah, blah. Um, he tied Northern Ireland to the EU and the uh, single market, the customs union, and he lied to the, to the Brex, Brexit supporters, we'll say, we don't need to be rude, about the UK to UK customs checks. The naive Brexit supporters cheered and hailed um, Boris Johnson uh, blah, blah, blah. You go, it's very rude, this, I have to say. But I think the point is that, yes, indeed, um, 
What a lot of the Brexit supporters understood to be the implication of Boris Johnson's deal ultimately is, is the point here is not what it actually is. Now that we're going to find out what it actually is. It's sort of like a duck and cover for some people because people are now going to find out what it's all about. Remember, Boris Johnson said at the general election, vote me a large majority and I will be able to deliver all of this. He was voted a large majority. No one can argue against that. This isn't like a five or ten seat majority, something like that. He got an 80 seat majority. He's now reduced it to 79 or 78 potentially. But he had an 80 seat majority before he sacked a Tory MP. Um, it's still sizable by any measure. Huge. So he said that he has the power now. He doesn't then get to say, actually, I'm too weak. I mean, I think he's too weak. I think the UK is too weak outside of the EU without a deal. But he said that we will be strong if you give me that majority. Well, he's got that majority. And, and that's ultimately it. So no matter how many times he tries to blame people, we need to come back to that central idea that you said... If we gave you a majority, you'd have the power to do all these wonderful things. We expect wonderful things. I mean, I don't anticipate them, but I think his supporters expect. And someone here saying, I particularly love the buried in the fine print unnoticed by many. So this was Ian Duncan Smith talking about aspects of the uh, withdrawal agreement. Buried in the fine print unnoticed by many, he said. Comments because it goes straight to the heart of the big difference between EU and UK in the Brexit negotiations. EU reads before they sign, UK signs before they read. This is why amateur UK politicians and negotiators don't stand a chance against the EU pros. In a way, I feel sorry for the Brexiteers who thought they could roar like lions and then be treated as little kittens. I, I mean, what I would say here is a slightly unfair. You say uh, why the amateur UK politicians and negotiators. Here's the thing. EU politicians are no brighter or, or, or better than UK politicians. I know that might sound a bit mad. And, and our negotiators aren't, aren't amateur either. The difference between the EU and, and the UK in this regard is that the EU elected representatives have listened to their officials and experts and decided policy based on facts. What our politicians have done is to ignore their expert advice, ignore it completely because it contradicts their political dogma. So they're not interested in it. So they listen to people who are not at all expert. Boris Johnson largely listens to Dominic Cummings. Dominic Cummings is an expert in bugger all. He doesn't, they've, in fact, they've been getting rid of the experts at the top of the civil service. You know, permanent secretaries in lots of government departments have been kicked out or forced out or encouraged to retire. So that's the difference. It's not that our politicians are inherently dumber or less well-informed than EU ones. It is that their lack of ability is being exposed because normally the civil service covers for you. It, it, it keeps you informed. That's its job, to keep politicians informed so they don't look like idiots. But when you do without that safety net of the civil service, you are going to look like an idiot. Um, next one. Is this the last one? Okay, so, yeah, it is the last one. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith, IDS, withdrawal agreement. Too long, did not read. I know, blame the EU. That always works. Oh, and by the way, I'm not to blame. I mean, here's the thing. We're, we're saying here, um, Ian Duncan Smith, we're imagining the situation that he didn't read the withdrawal agreement properly, and now he has done his outrage. We don't know that he's agreed, it, that he's read it, sorry, even now. All we know from his series of tweets, because he tweeted uh, to an article in The Sun, The Sun, which is like a comic for grown-ups in this country. Um, you know, it has a jumbo crossword and all the rest of it. Uh, it's, not, it's not for intellectuals. And um, so, yeah, all we know is that he's managed to read an article in The Sun. We don't know that he's read the withdrawal agreement even now. And if he ever has read it or part of it, we do not know which bits he understands. All he's done is he's read The Sun, which is written in language that anyone can understand, even Ian Duncan Smith. And he's just gone along with that without necessarily understanding. If I were to be able to ask him some questions, I might well find out that he actually fundamentally still doesn't know what's in the withdrawal agreement. There might be a still a few more horrors for him that have been undiscovered. 
But there we go. A um, few little comments from you there. We may do some more of these as well. It was my intention to do more of these. Hope you found the video interesting anyway. If you have, don't forget to click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I will see you later.